Good morning from Auckland, New Zealand. This is the Ocean, the crazy Asian guy. I'm going to be doing something completely different today. Uh, I won't be blasting the likes of uh, Kolya Zarov or the Party of Regions for that matter. I think I've done enough blasting for the time being. I would like to do something completely different tonight by addressing an issue with you that has been quite contentious for a long time, for the last 20 or 30 years to be exact. Now this region has um, always fascinated me. It is somewhat, I've always been kind of fascinated by it, um, by the way that people think over there. And this region has been receiving a lot of antagonism, criticism, even condemned by some politicians and certain media outlets. The region that I'm talking to you about is the Donbass. Now, I am no big supporter of Party of Regions, nor am I a big supporter of Renat Akhmetov. I'm not a big supporter of any political party for that matter. I actually advocate the abolishment of um, political parties and um, corrupt officials. No matter what party they're in, they should be booted out. I'd just like to say this. The Donbass clan who are in power right now are a poor representation of the Donbass region. I'll give you my reasons for it. Not everyone in the Donbass supports Renat Akhmetov and his shady activities. Not everyone in the Donbass supports Viktor Yanukovych, although they did vote for him in the last presidential elections just to keep Yulia Tymoshenko out of power. Now, why do people think like this? Why do people supposedly support all these corrupt, crooked, you know, rats. Well, you just have to take a look at their past. During the 1980s and the 1990s, the economic life in Donbass was tough. I mean, uh, the system had collapsed, there was economic stagnation. Practically, it was exacerbated by the Ukrainian independence in 1991. What happened in the Donbass was that um, the mining industry, which was the heartland of industry during the Soviet Union, it was home to the Stakhanovite movement, by the way, in the 1930s during Stalin's grandiose five-year plans, it had pretty much collapsed and ebbed away into nothingness, almost. And uh, practically there was mass unemployment, discontent and a huge nostalgia for the good old days of the Soviet Union. So what do people do? Well, the miners, sponsored by lucrative individuals such as the former head of the Jewish Confederation of Ukraine, decided to put on a strike as a means of bargaining their way into government, as a sort of blackmail, if, you, if I must say. Um, and what resulted under the Kravchuk administration back then was they were so afraid that the Donbass would become a separatist entity so they decided okay we'll bargain with you we will be more than happy to provide you with annual subsidies and the Donbass mining industry run by red directors who were phenomenal lobbyists in Moscow didn't quite play the same game in Kiev were successful in obtaining annual subsidies of supposedly two billion US dollars. They apparently still survive on these subsidies even to this day. Um, that only solved one part of the problem. The, the most gigantuan problem was the lawlessness in the country. If you watch the documentary Klitschko you'll know what I mean. When you, there's this part in, uh, in the film where uh, Vladimir Klitschko Sr. talks about professional athletes in, under the Soviet regime had stable lives, but then after Ukrainian independence, they lost everything. And overnight, they became gangsters. They would mug people on the streets. It was a really tough time for Ukraine, and even tougher for those who were living in the Donbass. As a result of all this lawlessness, the mafia industry just thrived. They just spread like a virus. And in this sinister world, there was one huge, um, notorious figure. His name was Akat Bragin, or Alec the Greek, they used to call him. He started off 
as a kind of a small-time businessman uh, supplying Western goods onto the black market in Donetsk. He eventually um, gathered a bit of a following, had victories in turf wars where he killed people, supposedly, and he eventually took over all these national industries in the Donbass, the mining industry, the Dom Donetsk National Bank, and eventually he took over the um, the jewel in his crown. He obtained the jewel in his crown, which was the Shakhtar Donetsk football team, which has been accused for the last, I don't know how many years, of money laundering and all sorts of shady business deals. I mean, football does move millions and millions of dollars. <coughs> And, um, of course, uh, he wanted to pretty much establish a monopoly um, of his business in the region. And pretty much anyone who stepped onto his turf became a cropper. I mean, there were these two brothers from Dagestan, the two brothers from Armenia and Azerbaijan. I mean, anyone who stepped onto his turf were dealt with. Now, he wanted of course, government to be under his thumb. Unfortunately, what had happened was in the nineteen, the mid-1990s, when he was really at his powerful stage, there was an even more powerful clan in power, and that was the Dnipropetrovsk clan, led by Kuchma's cronies, such as Pavlo Lazarenko, the former head of the uh, UESU, United Energy Systems Ukraine. Now, Pavlo Lazarenko is a shady businessman. He was successful in keeping Mot Motorola out of Ukraine and establishing his own company, Kyivstar, which is still operational, by the way. I mean, Motorola had the golden opportunity to hit the Ukrainian market. Pavlo Lazarenko bribed Leonid Kuchma, who was president at the time, and practically blocked Motorola from even entering so that he could make money from Kyivstar. Now, Pavlo Lazarenko wanted to establish his monopoly, obviously, of United Energy Systems Ukraine. And practically, the only way to do this, um, to establish this monopoly, was to send the Donbass clan hurtling straight into the Earth's core. So, Akat Bragan was killed by a massive bomb in the Shakhtar Stadium. There was also an, uh, a business associate of his, um, Yevgen Shetshaban, uh, excuse me for my wrong pronunciation, who was gunned down at Donetsk airport in broad daylight by assassins dressed up in police uniforms. His wife died as well, Yev, um, Mrs. Shetshaban, and um, his son only avoided the murder by hiding in his limousine. It was a really tough time. I mean, this was this is completely, I don't know. I mean, this seems like a completely different world to what I saw in Ukraine. It's Ukraine is not the country that it was back in the nineties, with all this um, murder, criminal underbelly. I mean, it does still have a criminal underbelly, but it's not the same country. This is it's cleaned up a lot now. So. Um, the Donbass people, of course, enduring all these hard times, they're, they're very tough, by the way. They have this blue-collar image. Um, they're working class, they work hard, and they made a lot of sacrifices. Um, they pretty much count on figures like Rina Akhmetov, on Viktor Yanukovych, to, keep, to bring them prosperity, the prosperity that they never had. They want to go back to the days of the Stakhanovite movement, the glory days. And uh, and unfortunately, they've, their leaders have really um, turned them into their little evil minions. And practically, when you hear about the BBC and they cover Viktor Yanukovych's life, I mean, Al Jazeera, even Al Jazeera does, does not have a pro-Yanukovych stance, <laughs> has a very anti-Yanukovych stance, if you really look at it. <clears throat> uh, Practically, yeah, the Donbass people have been represented as ma mafia supporters, thugs, um, one of the most dangerous areas in that part of the world. And I'd like to say that not everyone is a supporter of Rina Takmetov. Um, not everyone is a supporter of Viktor Yanukovych. These are criminals who should be tried in a court of law. They deserve to go to prison. 
or if they are if they do have these um criminal activities that the western media alleges if they do if it is true then they deserve to be tried in a court of law and there's a, they deserve to go to jail convicted and put into prison simple as that now to label this whole entire region as all party region supporters they're they're just um why do they want prosperity with russia well the Donbass was under the Russian Empire for many, many years. But then this is the, where the interesting psyche kind of kicks in. Because unlike the Kharkiv um, part of Ukraine, Kharkiv is just keen on keeping economic ties with, um, with Russia. Just more than happy. But the Donbass historically have always resented control from the outside. They never trust outsiders whether it was under the Russian Empire from Moscow, St. Petersburg, even Kiev, they don't trust people from the outside. That's why they keep on electing their own officials to be in higher places of power so that they can have, they can reach that goal of prosperity. Now, how do we tackle this problem? Well, it would help if you all read uh, about the Donbass and understand their history. You don't have to like it just understand where they're coming from and to go about this problem is to to really reach out to the ISEC Donetsk department and really encouraging foreigners to participate in internships over there I think the more the foreigners go to Donetsk I think the more they'll open up and my biggest regret when I was in Ukraine was not visiting this region. I should have visited, I really should have gone in, gone deeper into people's psyches and, you know, found out the reason why they were tough and that's my fault for that. And I wish to visit that region any day, any time. I'm more than ready. I'm more than ready to build bridges, unlike Yushchenko, the former president Viktor Yushchenko, by the way, after the Orange Revolution hit, you know, Donbass, they supported Yanukovych. I mean, you, you'll just see blue flags everywhere. You hardly see any orange flags, um, unless you're in a Shakhtar Donetsk uh, football game. Now, what happened was Yushchenko, after he was elected president, went to Donetsk and pretty much accused the entire region for thuggery, corruption, and criminal activity. Okay. This may have been true in terms of describing the Donetsk clan, the Donbass, um, the, the criminal, the mafiosi from Donbass, but he did nothing to build bridges. And that's where the failure of the Orange Revolution kicked in. It's pretty much isolating the Donbass, letting them kind of saying to them, okay, you pretty much did not support us, so you go off and rot. That was not the way of doing things. How did Nelson Mandela achieve unity for a time in South Africa. He reached out to his enemies. As soon as he was released from prison, he reached out to his enemies, he forgave them, and he said, well, how can we move on positively from here? That's what Yushchenko should have done. What he should have done was, he, he should have gone there, he should have said, I know you didn't support me, but I'm willing to build bridges with you. You're a part of Ukraine. He should have included them. I mean, society's problems arises when we exclude someone. And I think the Donbass have been excluded. They've been sitting in the shadows for too long. And no politician. And I, I worry about the opposition, really. I mean, if they do really come into power, will they continue to antagonize this region? Because that's not the way to go. We need to unite the country under one banner. Not we, but you. You need to unite the country under one banner and drag these people out of the shadows. Let them see the light of day. Love them. Embrace them as your brother, as your sister. Embrace them as, a, as you would a family. I mean, we, it's not about, we, you know, we can't do anything about the past, but we can move positively from here onwards. I mean, embrace them. Forgiveness. Forgive. There's no powerful tool than forgiveness. 
Don't forget that. Peace.